Good morning. How are you? How are you? How are you? We're, we're five minutes late, so now we won't leave until 1.30. Get you all to settle down a little bit, huh? You kids, sit down. Don't make me come back there. <laughs> um, we are going to be giving away those hymnals that we've been using. Um, we're going to the screen for the music uh, here. And so if you want one of those hymnals, they're the Gaither hymnals. And if you would like one or two or 12 or 13, why, help yourself. Uh, no, take a couple if you would like to. Uh, it, there are some back there, right? Yes. And if we run out back there, let Mick know, and he'll get you some more if you would like some. Um, was. We need to pray for a building, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you're not doing that... Would you, would you stop that? <laughs> would you turn around and start praying for a building, please? Uh, we, uh, we're, we're moving into that service. The 17th of September is our first service. Uh, we've had some great meetings. We've had two of the four meetings uh, set aside. If you have Thursday night open at 7, please come and join us and hear what's happening and, and where we're headed with the ISIS. Uh, also, we are taping those, and uh, we're doing a video of them, and they're on YouTube. Uh, I'm trying to send out a, a link for that, uh, usually on Friday sometime, and you can go back and listen to it if you want to. So uh, please do that. But uh, this is such an exciting time. Uh, it, it is just, uh, I can't wait to see what God is going to do. Um, my wife and I had a long talk the other night. I probably shouldn't say this about myself, but um, I guess I'm, I'm human. And there are times I have doubts. And there are times I struggle. And I need to apologize to you as a congregation for that. Uh, because that is not what I stand here and tell you to do. I stand here and tell you to trust in the Lord. And, and I got a wake-up call. I got a wake-up call. And uh, that's what we have to do. Uh, and, I, and I want you to think about it as an exciting time. I want you to look forward to it and what's going to happen because you're going to have a chance to help young people get involved more with the Lord. You're going to have a chance to, to help get this church, Eosis, the healing place, off, off the ground. And we're going to have a ball. We're going to have a ball together. So you pray about it. And uh, if you got the money, buy us a building, by golly, huh? Somebody can do that. This is a time to worship. God ordained this day for rest and restoration. God is worthy of worship, our creator, healer, and inspiration. So then, let us worship God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. And hopefully, Father God, it carries into every other day of the week. You are an awesome. So that we can be your disciples. And that's a real push for me right now, Lord. I want to be a better disciple. I want to lift your name up to everyone that I meet somehow. And if I always pray, Father, give me the words you always do. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. For what he did for us so that we have life eternal. We always have that hope and that desire and that link with you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Everyone in here, Father, goes through tough times. Everyone in here goes through tough times. 
When we pray in the morning, we should say, thank you for the day and all of the good and the hard times. Because those are the times that bring us closer to you. We love you. And we love you knowing that you love us so much more. So watch over our little church, Lord, as we do this transition. Help us all to have faith and trust in you. Help us not to worry, not to wonder, but to be excited about what you're about to do. Bless the leaders as we, as we do this transition, that we're listening to you. Bless the people as we do this transition, that they're praying, Lord. They're praying about it. Help us with the building. I know it's out there. You've already got it planned. You've already got it in place. So Lord, help us to know we are just human. We can't wrap our head around the things that you already know about tomorrow. But we can be excited. Be with those that are with us on the internet, Lord. A lot of them are going through difficult times as well. Comfort them. Give them strength to endure. And help them to know you better. As all be with the administration that are over the teachers. And let them know that you are over all of them. Lord, we pray all of these things as we pray that precious prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Would you take your Bibles, please? And I'm off. And would you turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Ephesians 5, 25 through 32. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his holy body. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. <laughs> this mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. And would you turn then to the book of Acts, chapter 5. And we are reading verses 12 through 16. Acts 5, starting in verse 12. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. But none of the rest dared to associate with them, 
However, the people held them in high esteem, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women, were constantly added to their number, to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. Also, the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. And I must tell you I'm sorry. I didn't tell Marcia how happy we are for you and your family. The cancer is gone. Well, good morning, kids. How are we doing? We're doing all right? Are you ready for this? Well, you don't even know what it is. But you're ready. I like that. That's a good. It's me. You know, the, the place we are in the book of Second Thessalonians and where we are in terms of this transition and launch you know, it, it puts us in a place where I, I, don't, think, I don't think any of us uh, misunderstand what Michael said a little bit ago. Hey, man, God, there's been, some, there's been some questioning going on. But it's also that opportunity to begin to experience something that revivals have in common. When there is a, a revival, God is going to do something. And there's a very big reason why God is doing something here in Fort Collins. Uh, before we were ever, uh, any of us, involved with something going on here in Fort Collins, maybe we were in a situation where we, in the late 60s, early 70s, we saw a piece of it, all right? But there are characteristics that are evident, and they are these. There is this desire for prayer. There is a desire for that prayer to be uh, deep. Finding ourselves kneeling, or at least kneeling in our heart. Uh, not just about friends and family, or those things are all important. But this is beyond that. There's a hunger in that prayer. There is a deep hunger, what we can't put, even put our finger on. Say, oh, man, this is the reason I have this. Also, there's this, there's this gathering, this desire to gather with others and pray. We have similar, uh, you know, the, we have a similar temperature in terms of that hunger. And it brings believers together to begin to pray, to seek God's heart, seek his mind. To begin to unify and line up and find ourselves in agreement with what God's doing as we seek him. And he begins, to, he begins to share with us what's happening and why it's changing our lives. And there's conviction. Conviction is a good thing. It's different than regret. We all have regrets over some things, but it's different. Conviction begins to move us closer to God and tell him these things are stumbling blocks for me. These things, Lord, are in the way. These things, Father... Uh, misrepresent you. These things, Lord, you don't want to have in me anymore. And there's also this contrition, this tenderness, this, this humility that begins to happen. There's a leveling of the playing field. And there's a readiness for what God's about to do so that the people of God can be a part of it rather than standing on the sidelines wondering what's going on. There's a revival of faith that includes this greater love of God, this first commandment, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. And there's a love for one another that begins to grow, the best to be seen in each other, helping each other. And then there's a love for others that what you would go through town and pass by and not even recognize me, suddenly now we have this heart to pray, this heart to connect, this heart 
for other people, even though they may be strangers to us. As you turn your Bibles to this final chapter of uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, you begin to take a look at what I just am talking about. The first chapter showed us in Thessalonians when we started that there had been this moment where Paul, Silas, and uh, Timothy show up. They preach the gospel. They're there for a short time because there's this uh, work of persecution that's coming at them because they've already been in other Greek cities. And the pressure becomes some, such that they have to basically flee the place. But what's happened in this time of, of the gospel being shared is people's lives begin to change as people exercise faith, repentance from dead works, and the certainty of faith. And it sticks with them. There's transformation that happens as people have this transaction with God. And we see in this, <laughs> this uh, first verse of chapter 3, Paul uses the word finally. Finally, brethren. He's closing up not every thought that he has. He's, he's giving them something to stand on in relationship to all that's taken place and where God wants to take them. He's giving them a caution because there are things that start to slip into a church that begin to cause, what, spiritual apathy. That we don't see it going on. There's things that begin to happen in the church that are out of character with what Christ has done. And the people in that apathy don't address it. They don't, they don't recognize it. They deal with it in such a way that it's easier to kind of, you know, just turn a blind eye. And he's giving them instructions about what's happening, but he's asking them at the start of this third chapter. He says, finally, brethren, pray for us. Wow. You know, it, it becomes this time for this church, and I'm going to put it in this way, where, where, where Paul is saying it's time to put on our big boy pants. And by that I mean it's time to start looking at becoming involved with a work that changed our lives. But now I'm being asked to invest in that work as a church and as myself. Man, that's a big thing. Where the one that brought the word now becomes the one that begins to rely on the reciprocity, this, this give and take that's happened out of this relationship that's been built in such a short time. I love that it's a short time because there's a picture that helps those who start works and be a part of works, it shows us that, man, it's not always about the grind. It's not always about how hard and how uphill both ways it is. And so it begins to say, man, God's in it, and he's found a place where that, that soil is taking that seed and receiving it, and there's fruit that begins to show up as a result. And he asked them to pray, Specifically, that the words of the Lord will what? Spread rapidly and be glorified. Wow. Maybe he needed a new car. Maybe his tunic has a little tear in it. Okay? Uh, maybe they need supplies to get from A to B. But he asked for this. That the word of the Lord would rapidly, this word rapidly means run. It would run because this gospel is so powerful that you represent, you're a, you're, a, you're, a, a, you're a partaker of this power. You've seen it happen. You've been a part of this what? This work that came out of prayer and hunger, seeking God, readying, wanting it, not even knowing exactly how it's going to unfold. Pray that this word spreads, and that what? And be glorified. There's lots of things in life that happen, and we go, wow, that turned out really well. Man, man, I was lucky. Or how fortunate. 
But this that he's talking about, he's talking about something that says this is the testimony of God in it. He's, he's among us. He's here. He showed up. That's what he's talking about. Glorify means it's evident that it's God. Back in Isaiah 62, he says, you know what? Man, pray. Seek me. Don't give me rest until Jerusalem becomes a praise in the earth. Where Jerusalem becomes something that as it progresses, as God works in it, that man, it doesn't matter if somebody's a Christian or not Christian. It doesn't even matter that they hear it from afar. They're, they're going to say, man, that was God. None other could happen. And he's asking this in such a way, he's saying, listen, this prayer that I'm asking for, he's saying, man, you experienced it just as it did also with you. And verse 2, it says that we would be what? Rescued from the perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. He's talking about this word, <laughs> this word, um, uh, uh, perverse. Now, we have a thing, we, we know what perverse means, but this word means that, man, something's missing. Something's in the wrong place. Something is being brought up and emphasized and used as a, as a weapon against us that's out of place. It's taking something God made and turning it against what God is doing. We find that in our world where there's so much sexual sin. Guess what? God invented sex. But turning it, twisting it, turning it into something that what? That used against even the testimony of who God is. Man, God protect us. Please pray that God would protect us. And from evil, that evil, we think, oh, evil is evil. Well, evil, it has a plan. It has a strategy. It has an action. And it has a goal. It's headed somewhere. Now, in God's view, in chapter just before, that goal, God already knows about it. He's planned for it. He's bringing what? Sin to a place where he's going to judge it for what it is. So we find ourselves in this place not unlike these people. God's moving us forward, and he's moving us forward in such a way that it's like, wow, wait a minute. Hold on, we're going a little too fast. We're going too soon. I don't understand all that's going on. All right. A uh, hundred years ago, I was stuck up in a bog in, uh, on a, not even a road in my 54 Chevy pickup. It was two in the morning, friend and I going in high school, going camping, which is an excellent time to go camping, by the way. And we got stuck in this bog. I mean, the, the, the truck sunk in down to the frame of the truck. We're going to be there forever. Our whitened bones will be found. <laughs> but what happens? I see these headlights coming this way. Two guys in a pickup truck coming across that bog, drunk as skunks. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we can help you. And we're facing this way. He gets his truck. He's going to go the opposite way. Hooks a chain on the frame of that uh, Dodge pickup. Uh, <laughs> he's pulling us out so fast, I have both feet on the brake pushing as hard as I can. And we're sliding in that mud. I have the wheel cranked over. We're not turning anywhere. He zoomed us out of this place. I wanted to be rescued, but I wanted it to be at a more comforting rate. We're moving forward in such, a, in such a way that we don't control the rate. And what happens is, is God wants us, folks, to, 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 to relinquish control and give it to him. Relinquish our, our, our former thoughts about how things work. doesn't make them all bad. But see, old thinking can't go into new ways. We have to learn new things. And we have to let God bring us to a place where not only are we seeking that God's word would spread, but man, we are seeking God to protect us from those things that have been roadblocks to us before. And some of those things in their strategy, in their plan, in their exercise of it, are specifically designed to cripple, to distract, 
to detour the work of God in Fort Collins. We alone have not all, it's not just been us that suffered from it. Verse 3, but you know what? The Lord is faithful. And he will what? Strengthen and protect you from the evil one. So with Paul and the boys are still talking to them about being strengthened. About being what? Firm. And standing in what he has given and testified to you in his son. Be firm in that. Don't let your thinking get compromised by how big the project is. How little the resources are. How we hear the howling saying, well, who, how dare you do this? How dare you? To get us to what? To think in such a way we don't even trust our own what? Thinking. We don't trust our own convictions. He says, man, don't. Don't go there. God's going to strengthen you and protect you from this purposed one that's not a political party. It's a spiritual being bent on not what? Not just destroying us, but using human beings as a weapon to defame and take away from God's glory. He says to them in verse 4, man, we have confidence in the Lord concerning you. He's saying, listen, the confidence that we have about you is because of the groundwork that God has done in you individually and corporately. There's been what? A great value that's developed from all the things that you've learned by trusting God in the past. But he's not asking you to take all those experiences and push them together and try to use them for this one. He's saying, man, you need to step up. You need to step up. Step up to a level of responsibility and faith none of us have ever had before. Step up. Step up where it takes us. It takes us closer to him. It takes us what? To a place where we get to learn. We become, we become continued learners. We have confidence concerning you. That you are what? Doing the will of and we can and to continue to do what we what? Command you. Man, I asked myself the question, Rick, can you be commanded? Commanded. Can you be commanded? Because this word means what? It means command. See, I would, all of us probably would say, well, if God told me I would. But he's going to say here in a little bit that his command came from a human in the name of Jesus Christ. Man, can I handle that? Americans don't like to be what? Commanded. But if you were in the military, you would know what that meant. That you would know. And they take people, and Tony knows, man, they take you through boot camp, they take you out of you. You become one of them. And you become instant in your obedience. Because you know you're going to face situations that you don't have time to get a committee together to see if it's okay if you should do this. Right? <laughs> that can, can I be commanded? And Lord, can I be used as a vessel to help correct other Christians? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm not saying we're going to command them. Can I receive a command? Can I be used of God to help other people in their course corrections to resolve an issue, to make their life better, and get them back on track? Can I do that? Can I, am I to be a part of that? We're going to see that in just a little bit. He uses this word in verse 4. He's going to use it several more times before we're done. But... We've come to this fifth verse. And he's saying now. He says, May the Lord 
direct your heart into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. Man, I, 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 all this has been good for me. But man, I got to this part. And man, God had to deal with, with me. He's not saying, hey, work on your love of God. He says, well, God, God will direct you. The Lord will direct you into the love of God. Now, this word love here is the word agape. We heard it, as a Christian, you hear it all the time. See t-shirts all the time. What is it? <laughs> what assuredly do we know that, what, what this is? See? This word had to be what? Invented in the Greek to try to e express and explain a level of love that all the other definitions couldn't, if you piled them all together, wouldn't work. Devotion, love of a friend, eros, all right? All these other things, man. You, could, you couldn't squeeze them and get good use out of them that became agape. They had to have a real new word. Agape is not about us. Agape is God's willingness to come and restore and to pay the price to make it so. That's agape. He came. Jesus is called what? Emmanuel. God with us. He came into the world. And he demonstrated what? Willingness. This willingness is more than what we would, we would call uh, an, an, uh, an act of a willing father. It's more than that. Because no father would willingly give up their child to a single individual or a corporate body where those, those people that he was sent to save and help would reject him, would mock him, spit on him. No human parent would do that. So as you go to Isaiah 53, and what does it say? It says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. Who was he talking about? He was pleased to crush his son. Pleased. Don't we? Man, does that word, man, it, it causes me to wrinkle up. He was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. It means makes him sick. If he would render himself as a guilt offering. See, the word if there allowed Jesus to choose what the Father had chosen. It allows Jesus to say yes. Remember in the garden? Hey, is there any way, Lord, that this can pass, can, this cup can pass for me? Yet, your will. The will of God is the passion of God. This passion that he's talking about is he's not trying to feed us with these lower levels of love all right, so that we're okay and we have a, a, a good self-image. and that No. He's killing us with the one that he allowed to die. We died with him. Our life ended in terms of our existence and being limited by that nature of sin. Our lives ended. And the huge good news is our lives ended. And the life that we now live, what? By faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. So we don't enter into the best of human love. Man, that's why the Bible is so clear. That's why the Bible says, man, unless you hate these very important relationships that can also t derail you by their absence or by their control... Man, unless you hate that and love me more, you have no part of me. He brings us to this place that this bringing us into the, what? The love of God means we're brought into the what? The passion of God. His passion now becomes our passion. 
What we thought we could love before was limited. Had a gas tank, had a, had a gauge on it. Well, that's too much, and that's too long. And those people are too weird. And all, all, this, all those things that would disqualify us or qualify us to just forget about that. That's gone. The same passion that drove him to come here for us becomes the passion that Paul is talking about. He says, man, this is going to be something you're going to go into. And then what? This steadfastness of Christ, this perseverance, this endurance that doesn't operate from the same tank where our energy level is. It brings us into this place. Well, when God brings us into the place of participation in what he's doing, he gets it all from us. He pours it into us, and we can pour it out. But we'll never exhaust or extinguish the source from where it came from. We find ourselves, man, I just, I just hope you men just camp there for a little bit. Because I'm going to contrast for you I don't know where my glasses are. If somebody sees my glasses back there, this is not going to go any further <laughs> until that happens. You do that in your life, you look like Columbo. <laughs> he does this work. And what I want to show is I want to contrast it. There's a church that's addressed in the New Testament. And what it's bringing out is this threefold nature of man's spiritual poverty. Have a spiritual indebtedness that's still there. First one is lack of faith in God. Second one, it's this problem of spiritual experience in the exercise of human will that we keep back from God what he's paid for in the blood of his son. Many who have trusted in God never yielded themselves completely to God and as a result have never been filled with the spirit because there's no room for them. That room is compromised because the room is still occupied with self. But this church he's, he's coming at, in terms of these first two things, they're okay. They've been faithful. They're this second generation. They're this generation that has now 30 years from its inception, and now 30 years have gone by. Now they're the members, they're the occupants of this church, and this history of its beginning is still there. But they focused on these two things. They focused on being pleasing to God by working hard and protecting the church from false apostles and bad doctrine. Their defect was a matter of the heart and what occupied their heart, not what occupied their actions as a local church. That something now was missing. This passion, this agape, had been what? Set aside and replaced with this duty. Duty's not bad, but it can't stand by itself. The period following Pentecost, back to the beginning of where this church came from, was characterized by love and devotion for Christ himself. A love for the word of God, a love manifested in fellowship with the saints and their prayer to God. What we talked about in the beginning, these aspects of hunger and this getting close to God was what they were all about. And that rolled over into their behavior. It rolled over into what they did. And what they did, what they did manifested this glory of God. Wow. Who can deny that? Because what? We, Michael read about it earlier. 
The lame are walking. The blind see. The deaf hear. The gospel is preached. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't often use those as qualifiers or evidence of the reality of God's presence. We use them as special things. Well, that was special. That happened in Bangladesh. That happened in South Africa. And we read the testimonies. Nothing wrong with that. But wouldn't reading the testimonies make us hungry for the deaf and the blind and the lame that live among us? So he's saying to them, listen. They had come a long ways in 30 years from what we just talked about. And they continued to labor faithfully as those who had preceded them. The love of God which characterized the first generation was absent. The first commandment's fulfillment was absent. The cooling of their heart which had overtake them in their relationship to God was a dangerous forerunner to spiritual apathy. Because we're going to deal with apathy in just a little bit. Thus, I like that word, it was, has ever been the history of the church, first a cooling of spiritual love, then the love of God replaced by the love of things, and resulting in a compromise and a spiritual corruption. This is followed by departure from the faith and the loss of effective spiritual testimony. The testimony becomes minimalized. God is exercised and glorifying him in, in little bitty ways with long spans of time between them. In other scripture, there's the danger of fading from the love of God is described. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after, they have erred from faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. There's a danger of loving the world. The love, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The mixing of loves is not agape. That's John, 1 John 2.15. The danger of substituting love for idols for the love of God is stated in the closing verse, little children, keep yourselves from idols, 1 John 5.21. Even loved ones can stand between us, Matthew 10.37. But he who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Wow. Don't we all struggle with unworthiness? How can we kind of amp it up? (laughs) We become more unworthier, all right? By where our affection, where our passion goes. Because at the end of Matthew 10 and verse 40, it says, He who receives you, I'm sorry, he who receives me, and he who receives me also receives the one who sent me. Man, who can pass that up? Whatever the object of love, anything which hinders a true love for God may cause a Christian to lose his first love, even as this church so long ago. To correct this this work, he said, man, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Where did the free fall start? We talked last week about the apostasy, that people will what? Fall away. We have to be someplace. Johnny and I talked about this. He mentioned this. You have to be someplace where you can fall off it. All right? How many of you love ladders anymore? No. Nobody does. Okay? I loved them as a younger man. He says, man, you, you remember where you've fallen. To remember the agape which once gripped our hearts the cause for it, the wonder of the newfound salvation, and the joy and satisfaction that were theirs in Christ. They let go of that passion of God and begin to develop a passion in another way. 
forgetting that which once was known. Man, that is chunky. And he says, and he exhorts a man to repent. Change your mind. Turn. Go a different direction here. Return to God. Come back. He's urging us to come back. And he's going to take us into the heart of the love of the Father. And this next piece in terms of the steadfastness of Christ. And then he says to them, love this one. He says, do the works of that you did at first. What motivated? What drove you? What took the place of every mountain, every hardship, every difficulty was not big at all. Because we were stepping into, man, that because what? He says, what? The life we live now. We live by what? We just said Faith in the Son of God who offered himself up. And he says to these people, he warns them. He says, man, if you don't, what? Receive this exhortation. If you don't receive this course correction, if you somehow let it slide or say that whoever is preaching right now doesn't know what they're talking about. If you let this thing slide, there's going to be a consequence of removing this lampstand, this candlestick, this anointing, this abiding that comes out of knowing him. The meaning, this is, this, is, this is big. The meaning is that he would remove the church as a testimony for Christ. He would let all that work stuff go on. He let all this sweat and effort. All this as fundraising and, and uh, 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 parties and dinners and all that, man, keep going, keep doing it, exist in that way, but man, listen, my testimony is not in it, man, I'll tell you what, that is breathtaking, so do we move toward the love of God because of the consequence, no, we need to see that the consequence is because we've moved away from God, not because God's moved away from me, and this church that I'm talking about had a heyday, it began to decline. Turks came and deported most of the people. The cities now exist today. You can go visit it. It's just ruins. It is now seven miles. They, the city location didn't change. But it's now seven miles from the coast because silt filled in one of the best harbors in the world. So we find ourselves going on to these next verses, and we're going to do those quick. My, desi my desire today is not to scare you or to beat you down. I'm not doing that. I'm exalting the church of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 7, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. He's going to, he's going to talk about what example they saw in these three guys that came for these three weeks. And the returning of Timothy that uh, was there, that uh, eventually went back to the other guys with a good report. He says, you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you. We kept in line with this passion of God. We kept in line with this steadfastness. He's not saying we're superior Christians to you. He's saying, no, we live between what? The yellow lines on the highway. Well, that's where we live in this narrow way. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. Without, and but with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to you. He said, you know what? We're going to set aside a right to be taken care of by the church so that we might give the church something to look at that we're not here to take your money, but it's far, far beyond that. He's saying, you know what, we can set aside a right to bring something to you that becomes a better testimony. 
in the short run because immaturity would make you not want to help or give. But we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna cure the immaturity by this example as you see it happening in front of you. Not because, verse 9, because we do not have a right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would have to follow our example. That people are not something that you use for yourself. Now, giving and supporting uh, the leadership in a church is not the same thing. But he says, you know what? We're going we're gonna to take care of this so that you understand, to, you understand this model that you can give without requiring somebody to give back. This is how we face people in the world that resist us. We don't like rejection, do you? Do you love it? You like being misunderstood? I hate it. But that's overcome because I don't have to expect something back when I give them the precious gold, when I give them the testimony of Jesus, when I walk up to them and I say, man, my name is Rick, nice to meet you. Guy at the table says, yeah, man, my name is James. James. Are you hungry? Have you had something to eat today? He says to me, no, man, I don't need it. Man, please give it on to somebody else that might need it. I said, man, it's great to meet you, but did you know? Do you understand? Have you what, come to the place in your spiritual life where you know for sure you're going to heaven? It becomes this Instead of looking for the rejection, we become prospectors for the gold. We've got a little donkey. Can you see it? Our pickaxe on the sides, panniers over the frame. But we're not going and just dig a hole someplace. We're going where gold can be found. We don't go up to everybody, but, man, God will highlight people to us that before we didn't even see it. There's something about this hunger. There's something about this prayer. There's something about this conviction, this contrition, this what? This revival of faith that begins to what? Animate not one or two, but the body of Christ to be able to step into and be a part of and also be a learner that we can what? Yes, Lord, command me. Yes, Lord, go ahead and do that. Yes, Lord. I'll be used as a help to somebody else. Even if it's a situation where I have to address something in their lives that's gotten off track. For even when, verse 10, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. Order, right? Eh? That's the same word here, over here in verse 4, uh, verse four uh, verse four, same word command. Order, if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. It seems basic. My dad had that belief in him a right, long time ago. All right. But he's saying, man, this, this work that you've been through, this, this description of God, this passion of God that you've entered into now becomes your passion. There becomes things that when we don't see the word of the Lord as something that we need to eat and receive, we begin to live in such a way that we want, we can get off under the same man, I'm just not willing. Uh, God's dealt with me on a retirement. I think it's, I think it's to all Christians. They're, they're, the Bible doesn't say you retire. It doesn't say you have to work in the coal mine the whole time. But your value to him is as long as you are on this earth. Where is it you're going to be what? Planting. Where are you going to be a part? Where are you going to uh, give that help? Older, older gentleman in my life, man, he, he couldn't walk anymore. He, he fell every time he stood up. Uh, his wheelchair had a, a flat all right, had a smooth side, so he kind of kathump, kathump down the hallway. All right, hard for him to get around. All right, and yet his in his drawer were pages with people's names on them that he prayed for these people. And occasionally he would send him a little note, encourage him, send him a little scripture, maybe call him, man, how you doing? He became an active part and didn't allow. Hey, I can't run very fast anymore. Didn't allow that to become something that took him out of the game. Because there were people in the church that were living in a way 
that was not in keeping with the life that was in Christ. I've heard some people say, and it's probably true, that they you know, believed Jesus was going to return, uh, and so they decided that they didn't need to work. I'm not even sure it was that good of an excuse. I think once you start living off other people, it's hard to break that. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life. See, the work that they were not doing was a testimony that said that God is not at work. What does he say? It says, man, with this faith we have in God, this hunger we have from him, this entering into this passion of God, this agape of God, brings about what? Evidence in what we do that it's him. And so when we miss the mark and we go sideways on this situation and we start living in a, in a way that he calls undisciplined, it, we're going to see it in a minute, it's unruly because it's not in keeping. And what happens is he says, uh, he says they live an undisciplined life doing no work at all, but they're acting like busybodies. They're acting like the newspaper. But it's not the what? Why don't, it's not the newspaper from 50 years ago that I liked, okay? <laughs> All right? They're acting like it's a tabloid. Did you know? So and so, thus and such. Busybodies. In the name of what? Helping, fellowship. Now, such persons we command, here we go, and exhort, whoa, in the Lord Jesus Christ to work and in, quiet, in a quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Is that asking too much? Is that judgmental? See, that's... He says, man, we're, we're going to command these guys. No. In the name of Jesus, man, that is out of order. Right? You come up in the morning, and one of your kids is swinging by one of the cupboard doors in the kitchen. And around his mouth, much like Suzanne's puppies, or puppy, is the remnant of chocolate chips. And we do one of two things. We can say, oh, man, isn't that cute? All right? And what we've done is we've unleashed that what? That out-of-control person that's now in control of my house. No, I don't think any of us in here would allow that. We would exhort them. But as for you, brother, in verse 13, man, this is a good one. He says, don't grow weary in doing good. Don't get sick of it. Don't get weary of it like, oh, he's listening to me. If anyone does not obey our instruction, man, this is, this is a word obedience. In this, le in this letter, take special note of that person. And man, don't associate with him so that he will be put to shame. He's saying, listen. When somebody is unruly or undisciplined, they've gotten off track and they're trying to promote that in the church as if, man, this is okay. We shouldn't interact with them in the same way that we did when everything was good. Somebody takes your tires off your car and you find out who they are and they happen to be a neighbor. Hey, neighbor, man, how you doing? All right? It's, no, that relationship is not helpful. They need something else. Man, take that step back. God does this all the time to folks. I've had God step back on me. I don't know about you guys. I've had him say, if that's what you want to do, have at it. And when you're sick of it, I'm right here. It's not punishment. It's not being evil. It's not judgmental. Don't associate with him so that he'll be put to shame. Now, people don't like that name or that word. We don't want to shame anyone. Well, sometimes they need it. Sometimes that, that conviction is not working. That contrition is not there. So we're not beating them down. We're not telling them they, you know, their mom dressed them funny. It's not something that we're taking lightly. But it says this. Yet don't regard him as an enemy. Don't come at him like, you're, man, you're, uh, I'm cutting you off. But admonish him as a brother. He's not your enemy. And don't be scared of him because he might become an enemy or him or her. But man, help them. The course is off course. Where they think they're going to arrive at, they're not. And these little course corrections. I remember Mike Stevens back 100 years ago. He was a young man playing basketball and 
and uh, he was he was getting into this whole trash mouth thing and, and using foul language on the court because he saw professionals doing that. He said, "Mal, could do that too. Now watch me, okay?" And he had some guy that he was playing against standing next to him, and he says, "Man, shut up, bucket mouth." And he was so convicted by that. He was like, "What? I thought I was being cool and inclusive." All right. <laughs> They brought a conviction that wasn't from this person. It was in the name of Jesus and God in that way. All right. Now, verse 16. May the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every way, every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This, this last bit, he's giving a benediction to them. He's not just saying nice things so he, he closes. He's saying, listen, this whole last chapter is, man, listen, give yourselves to the things that count. All right? Let God bring you into his heart. But let also God bring you into this endurance, this perseverance, this perseverance, this steadfastness of Christ so that you become one, a helpful piece of the body of Christ. And not only can you help correct somebody else, but you can what, be corrected. You can get better. But he says, man, peace, the Lord of peace, grant you peace in every circumstance. How many circumstances? Every one, all of them. Father, we thank you for the testimony of your word. We thank you, Father, for the life that is in you. We thank you for your passion. We thank you, Lord, how you've loved us. No poet, no great author, no amazing religious leader had even the barest concept of the love that you brought to us in your son. And what you've done is you've made us like you in the restoration, and now we should walk in the empowerment of that life so that our vessel can be occupied by your spirit in a whole and a, in a whole and powerful way. And so I thank you, Father, for what we face. We face it not individually, we face it together. And Father, we step up, we step up, Father, to run this race, that your word may go rapidly out and Father, may bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul, let's go together. Into this heart, because he bids us, and let him do with us what seems good to him. And let go of everything that lies behind and reach, stretch to that upward calling that brings us not only closer together, but it brings us closer to him, to fulfill what we laid in bed at night pondering as a, as a teenager, as a young married person, as a worker, as a, as a person that's gotten older, we pondered it. Oh God, I read in your, bur your book about your great works of power. And Father, I yield to this, that in my day, like <laughs> our Brother Habakkuk says, Lord, in our time, do it and be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.